now so that I actually remember to do that. Thank you all for coming to this RCOE sponsored um, video cast on self care for educators using applied behavior analysis and um, our very own Dr. Awit De uh, Des. How do you say your last name that I don't flatter it? But just the Lusong. Daily song. Shut up. I want to make sure that I honor your name, Dr. Alwit. So sure, you. I don't blame you. Thank you so much for um, agreeing to present today to help us with our own self-care during this time. And so I will turn it over to you. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. While we were waiting for people to come in, uh, it was just Shelly, me, and Amy, and S. I was like, oh, I don't think there'll be people coming in because most not well, most, but a lot of you already are on, on um, summer break. But I'm glad that you're here because we all need some sort of self-care. And I, I was telling Shelly earlier that this is really not my wheelhouse. Um, I'm not a psychiatrist, but when um, we were brainstorming on ideas for PLC a couple of weeks ago, I thought that um, with the pandemic going on, it would be good for us to practice self-care because really no one is an expert on uh, the pandemic and working from home. So I thought maybe just to make it more um, relatable, I would be using ABA principles in order to make sense for a lot of educators. So I, I'm hoping that you're not getting seizures with all these um, thing going on in the background, but the next few slides won't have this animation anymore. So let me just move this window right here. Yeah. So we are all facing a new kind of stress. Um, the pandemic um, is causing us to worry about our own health and the health of our loved ones. Um, changes in sleep, either you're getting too, too less sleep or too much sleep. In my case, I've been getting too much sleep right now and it's really causing some weird dreams. And then um, w during the pandemic, we have um, confusing beliefs about the virus. There's just so many things out there that's not true, fake news about the virus that's really causing more stress than usual. So like what I said earlier, uh, people have been getting weird dream dreams uh, during the pandemic. And the first um, two weeks of the pandemic, I was actually um, having crazy dreams, weird ones, and, uh, but nothing compared to what my husband, um, <laughs> one of my husband's dream, and I'm just going to share it. I'm sure he doesn't mind, but um, he dreamt that we were watching the Taylor Swift concert. I don't know why. And he needed to go to the bathroom. So um, he told me to wait outside. So this is a dream, you guys. So he told me to wait outside. And then, so he was ready to go to the bathroom. And then as soon as he closed the you know, the door to the cubicle of the, the stall. Uh, for some reason in his dream, it was an elevator going up. And then so he was panicking because he was trying to pee, but the elevator was trying to, you know, go up. And then so he opened the cubicle door, was not able to pee. And as soon as he opened it, it was Taylor Swift. And he was so upset at Taylor Swift for uh, waiting in front of the cubicle for the men's. So I was like, okay, that's, like you top the weirdest dreams uh, for the pandemic ever. But there is an explanation why we are having weird dreams while uh, we are undergoing this work from home situation. And I will just play this video to explain why. Trouble sleeping right now. You are not alone with all the stress and anxiety that we're all under. A lot of people are having sleep issues. And Dr. Maria Simbra has some advice on how to get better sleep. If you're not sleeping well these days, you're not alone. We have a, a big increase in patients complaining of insomnia during the viral pandemic. They'll say that they're anxious and that uh, a lot of patients will say that they may not have had insomnia before this. But now they do. Less structure in the day has changed routines. We're not exercising. We're eating at all different hours. We're watching the news or, or Netflix or TV shows at 2 in the morning because we can. It's It's... The exact opposite of what we would tell patients to do. They find themselves sleeping at odd hours, perhaps having weird dreams. For some people, anxiety fuels the insomnia and frequent awakenings during the night. Other people are sleeping longer, but with that comes more REM sleep or rapid eye movement sleep, a stage later in sleep when dreams occur. 
Some of these can be vivid or disturbing. I think it's stress and it's, it's our body's way to try to sort out what's going on. Dreams try to help you make sense of things that happen. Uh, they also help solidify memories and put a, a, a psychological component to them. How do you feel about what happened? Between February and March, filled prescriptions for sleeping pills, anti-anxiety medicines, and antidepressants jumped 21%. Lately, Dr. Shade has been prescribing sleep medicines more, which he says is okay for the short term. But the pandemic may not be over quickly. If the insomnia is due to anxiety or depression, that needs treated a little bit differently in a long-term manner. Because healthy sleep contributes to a healthy immune system, he has this advice. Keeping that sleep-wake time, even though your schedule is all over the place, is one of the most important things you can do. Aim for seven to nine hours consistently. I'm Dr. Maria Simbra, KDKA News. So Trouble sleeping oops. right So hopefully that uh, video kind of explains why we're having all these weird dreams. Um, it's really, when I was really researching about it, it's mostly we have more rapid eye movement, which means that we are probably getting longer sleep um, hours. And it means that when we sleep longer, we dream more. So that's why we're getting all these vivid, weird dreams. And then aside from having those dreams, we're also working from home, which is really difficult because uh, we really did not sign up for a work from home situation being in the education field. Um, if you're a teacher or an instructional assistant or working for um, RCOE in a capacity of an educator, um, you are working alongside with your kids who you are homeschooling right now. And I don't know about you guys, but I, if you've heard about the saying about the cobbler, uh, having the son of the cobbler has the worst shoes in town, it basically means that you might be a great teacher, but then you are not as effective of a teacher when it comes to your own children. And I myself can attest to that. I believe that I, am, um, I have some skills with behaviors with other students and other individuals. But when it comes to my own son, I, I question myself and my husband questions me as well. And he's like, are you sure you know what you're doing? Because Ethan's not listening to you. But I think there's that fine line between being a parent and being a behaviorist, being a parent and being a teacher. So it's, it's really causing more um, stress for a lot of our teachers because they're not only teaching their students online, but they're also trying to homeschool their kids. And then uh, it's really difficult separating work life with home life at the moment. Um, when we were uh, driving to our school sites, when we we're driving to our offices, we kind of have that natural break um, during, the, during the drive. Like when we get home, we kind of have to turn off or not really have to turn off, but it's an automatic response that, oh, all right, I'm already home, so I'm going to switch off the work mode um, in the brain. But now since we're working from home, everything is all meshed together, and you kind of don't have that clear boundary as to is this um, work or is this home life? So it kind of blends together. So it's causing more stress. And then video calls like Zoom tend to be very intrusive to our privacy. Like I feel like people are judging my living room or people are judging you know, uh, my workspace. And so there's that intrusion that we uh, a lot of people feel. And then we're working in, in unsuitable places in our home. As teachers, we really don't have, uh, most of us don't have um, an office, office, home office, because we really don't need one. And now we're using our kitchen table. We're using our bedroom to do office work. So it's really not suitable, the setup that we have. And then having that Zoom conferences and, um, you know, just working through the internet, it's not really personal. It's, it's hard ha being collaborative with others when it's just, you know, it's not 3D, it's 2D. You're just looking at the screen and trying your best to like interpret what other, people's are, what other people are saying. And working from home, you feel isolated. You are used to having people go in and out of your classroom. You're used to people, you know, having lunch with you in the lunchroom. Now you don't have that. And then like what I said earlier, we did not sign up for, um, 
you know, a work from home situation. We are educators and that human connection for us is really important. So it's one of the things that's causing more stress for us. And then I don't know if you guys heard about Zoom being so draining. So I did a research on why Zoom can be draining for a lot of people. Um, and for those who attended Kelly's uh, talk um, two months ago or a month ago, she said that it's really hard for her to see different people, uh, the squares on Zoom, because it's just too much movement. And then the tendency I'm doing a training, I kind of read the room and like see, oh, she's getting sleepy. Oh, this person is not paying attention. So I kind of have to adjust my tone, adjust my jokes, adjust my, um, you know, my cadence when I'm doing the training based on what I see. But now that everyone is either turning their uh, videos off or they're just staring at the screen, it's really hard for me to see if you are understanding what I'm saying. So in a sense, our brain is working double time. So it's causing us to um, be more anxious and be more um, depleted at the end of the meeting. And then it's weird actually looking at yourself talk in front of the computer. And I am looking at myself now and I was like, oh my gosh, use my hands a lot. A lot. So it's it's that constant, you know, mirroring of what you're doing that's also draining. And then uh, with a work from home situation, it's always the the work is always on the computer and it there's no change in scenery whereas when we're in the classroom setting we go out to the gym we go out to the we go out for a walk we go to the cafeteria so there's always that change of scenery and working from home we don't have that anymore so we have that loss of connection and loss of compartmentalization compartment compartment i can't say it compartmentalization so basically what it is is you can't really compartmentalize what is work and what is supposed to be time with your spouse and time with your children. So it's really causing us to be more anxious. And so let's think about our current reality. When you wake up in the morning, do you already feel drained? Do you, do you, um, do you dread having another round of Zoom meetings when you wake up in the morning? At the end of the day, before going to bed, do you feel drained? Um, for me, my threshold for, for Zoom meetings is at two meetings a day. Anything uh, more than two, it causes me to like just zone out by the time it's like one o'clock in the afternoon because it just it's not as personal and it's just really like staring at the screen. I feel like I need my glasses to be, I need my eyes to be re-evaluated because I feel like I can't see with my regular glasses anymore. And then um, when we are trying to reflect about our current career, about this teaching, uh, distance learning, how do you feel about it? Because I, for one, miss going to the classrooms. I miss going to the sites. I just feel that I did not sign up to be a work from home person and I feel like I'm less productive uh, working from home so if I reflect on my current situation I feel like I have more to offer than just working in front of the computer so that's how I feel and so it's really important for us to think about how we could uh, practice self-care because before we can take care of others before we could take care of our students and their parents, because at the moment, you're really not just handling students, you're also handling parents. And for the most part, I think 90% of our communication is through the parents. Um, before you could take care of them, them, we need to take care of ourselves. So we have to make sure that we take care of our physical and mental health in order for us to be more resilient and to recover from the setbacks that we have with this pandemic and with all these riots going on at the moment. So here comes the ABA part of um, trying to analyze why we don't practice self-care um, more than we should. So I know that most of you have attended my trainings and you've heard of the, about the four functions of behavior, about escape, attention, access, or automatic reinforcement. So think about those functions of behavior in terms of self-care. What is causing you to escape from taking care of yourself. Think about it. What is it that you feel need more attention other than yourself 
when you are trying to figure out how you could practice self-care? Are you providing more attention to other people, more attention to work than yourself? So think about that. And then when you are thinking self-care, are you trying to access things? Um, do you think work is more important at the moment than your own well-being? Or for automatic reinforcement, are you just content with what you're doing that you feel that I don't need to practice self-care because I'm busy with what I'm doing? And at the moment, this is what's making me you know, thrive. Working, emailing, all these things, it's, it's just what, who I am and I'm comfortable with this. So I don't need to like step out of you know, my comfort zone and practice self-care because that's not my, that's not my thing. So think about why we're not doing self-care along that lens of the functions of behavior, just so we have that starting point. What is it in your current situation that is, um, that's preventing you from practicing self-care? So just think about it. And then when you hear me do my trainings, I always say uh, it takes 21 days to form a habit and then 90 days to form a lifestyle. So here are some tips for us to be able to become more um, effective and efficient when we're working from home. So first is, let me just move you guys because it's blocking the other side. So make a list of the things you need to do at specific time slots. So let's say I'm gonna check my emails from eight to 9.30. I'm just gonna dedicate that time for emails. And then I'm gonna dedicate 12 o'clock to one o'clock just for getting in touch with parents through phone calls. So if you have a designated time slot for specific assignments that you need to do, it will make your life easier instead of just having the whole day randomly trying to catch up on a lot of things. And so you group your tasks together and then you have to make sure that you um, schedule non-negotiable breaks throughout your day to exercise, to have your, your snacks, and to have naps. And this, I think, is the greatest problem that I have. I've been having a lot of naps in between um, throughout the day. Not really throughout, but it would be like a power not nap of about 15 minutes um, from 1 to 1.15. And so I'm like really worried when I come back to work and I was like, I'm going to probably need that nap. So I'm going to have to step out of it. but since we have that luxury of just being home so why not take those power naps in between just to refresh yourself and then stick to this routine for three weeks in order for it to turn into a habit and then this one i grabbed from um one of the websites for teachers and then they said that when we're working from home the computer has to be at least an arm length away from, from your face, so about 25 inches, to make sure that your eyes are well rested and it's not straining. And you have to follow the 20-20-20 rule so to reduce eye strain. So for every 20 minutes, look at something 20 feet away. So it could be the tree outside, or it could be you know, um, a plant, or whatever it is that's soothing, for at least 20 seconds, and it helps you reestablish yourself and become more um, refreshed because it doesn't like you're not staring at the screen all the time and then the idea is also for us to get up every 15 minutes for every two hours just so we're not stuck at home and we're not be i'm not stuck in the couch and being um, a couch potato we have to make sure that we incorporate getting up at least 15 minutes for every two hours and then alternate every 30 minutes sitting at a desk and standing. So you can see a picture of what a teacher did. Um, he, you know how our secretaries have the very desk where it goes up and down and we don't have that luxury at home, but we could improvise and just get, you know, one of the boxes that from Amazon and just so uh, put it on top of your computer, just so you have that uh, capability of standing and sitting while you're doing your work. All right. So here comes the self-care part. And I'm gonna share this video. I really feel that um, when I watched this video, it made a lot of sense. So think of it as watching it from a lens of 
yeah, I'm not taking care of myself. And a simple ice cream sundae makes a big difference in our life. So just think of it along that lens that we need to do something for ourselves. And even if it's just two minutes of our life doing something for ourselves, it makes a big difference. So I want you to watch this video and really think about the power of doing self-care. Means everything. <laughs> I'm gonna go talk to my stepdad. He deserves forgiveness. <laughs> What is this place? Just an ice cream shop, man. Let us whip something special up for you on the house. Do you usually go for something chocolatey, fruity, medicinal? Chocolatey? Are you drawn to fireworks or laser shows? Fireworks, I guess. And how does this taste? There's nothing on this spoon. Right. How does it taste? As expected. So, I gotta get going. The, the orders were for Marcus and Patricia. Totally. Orders coming up. How long have you been paying off those credit cards? Sorry? Notice four in that wallet slot on the back of your phone. You look to have wear and tear in these sending order. And holding down three jobs simultaneously? How do you The black non slip shoes from your bar back job, the paper cuts on your fingers from your weekend movie ticket tearing. Well, frustrating scrambling for cash to gain freedom. You're being free to take a break. All this work for other people, but when was the last time you took a moment? For yourself. It's been a while. It's been a while. Yeah, it's the it's the credit card thing. It's just like it feels so hard to get out from under it. I feel like I'm chipping away a little, but with the stress of all these jobs, I feel like I'm bad at at least one of them at all times. My mom had this talk with me at Thanksgiving that scared me into realizing like I really need to take care of this now. The worst part is I feel like I could get a handle on all of this and be out of the woods on everything in like three months if I had just just one second to slow down and, and catch up on everything. But I, I don't date, I don't have time or money. I have all these business ideas, but I can't get anything started because I can't afford to get anything on the credit. I feel like I can't catch up on anything. I'm like, Sunday. You don't need a Sunday. You need a Friday night. No, wait. cream and pop rocks. Wow. Hey, I had no idea how bad I needed that break. Sometimes when you're drowning, you just need that little gasp of air at the surface to see the island. Thank you. Wow, I feel rested. I feel ready. Three more months, and I'll be through the woods, and I'm launching my company. Oh, what is it? Oh, it's a new dating app. You, you open it up, and it tells you the date. Hmm. Oh, don't forget the orders. You're going to want refunds. We should hire a financial means everything. So basically, I really like that video because it shows us that if we just give ourselves that time, that time to enjoy ice cream, that time for gasping for air and just making sure that we focus on ourselves, it feels like 17 years of vacation already. So we have to make sure that we give time to ourselves, even if it's a small thing. If it's a break from the routine, it will really help us. So I really like that video because it gives us that perspective that small things will matter when it comes to self-care. So going back to the ABA principles, when we are addressing negative behaviors of our students, um, when I do FBAs and functional, functional behavior assessments and behavior support plans, I always have a functionally equivalent replacement behavior. So basically what it is, is um, a student does not want to do the work. We tell the student, 
if you don't want to do the work, instead of hitting, you could ask for a break. So you could still get out of work, but in a socially more acceptable way. So similar to that concept, here is what we can do in order for us to uh, dedicate time to do self-care for ourselves. So this is how a behavior support plan looks like. This is called the competing pathways chart wherein we look at the antecedent, what happens prior to the behavior. So we look at the problem behavior here as let's say practicing self-care. For a student, um, escape from work could be the problem behavior. And um, just tears, uh, so the behavior would be tearing the worksheet apart. And the function for the behavior of the student is to escape. So in order for us to teach the student to escape the tasks appropriately, we come up with alternative behaviors. So similar to that thinking, when we're doing self-care, uh, the problem behavior is we don't have, in our mind, we don't have time to do self-care. So what do we do in order for us to make sure that we have an alternative behavior? What can we practice to make sure that we have time to practice self-care? Um, in our lives. So think about that pathway in terms of your own life. So the functionally equivalent replacement behavior is to make sure that we have a self-care plan. We look at a self-care plan as something that would be more of a preventative measure. So we are looking at it as designing a roadmap for ourselves so that you're only you have it not during in time not in times of crisis but you already have it in place so when you need it all you have to do is open your plan and you already have the resources available to you um in order to escape you know the grueling task of work or work from home and then in order for us to uh take the guesswork out of it in terms of in moments of crisis we have to make sure that um when uh when developing the self-care plan that we have it in place and that we actually practice it not in times of escalation we we do it regularly that way it becomes part of our routine it becomes part of our habit that um you know within a few months it became it becomes a lifestyle so really having a plan in place Will help, will help us become better at caring for ourselves. And it also helps us stay the course. So if you have the plan, it makes sure you have no excuse not to follow it because you already have the plan in place. So it's really important to have a self-care plan. And how does a self-care plan looks like? So it has different components. So you, how do you take care of your physical, your body in healthy ways? So what you do is just write three things in, in for you to like think of that will help you take care of your physical self. Three things that will help you take care of your emotional um, well-being or your feelings. Three things that will um, take care of your mind to make you understand yourself better. Three things about social self-care. How can you improve your relationship with others around you? Three things for how to spend and save more responsibly. Because if we have that, then we're not stressing out about money. Three things. Spiritual, it doesn't have to be religious. It's just to gain perspective on life. What are the three things that you could do in order to gain perspective in life and become better at it? So the next several slides that I have, I actually downloaded this um, from a website. It has like activities. I think it was like 175 activities to practice self-care. And so I could send you that link so you have an idea of what you could do that is not gonna cost you a lot of money in order to pra practice self-care. And what I did for the next probably five slides, I just underlined things that I could give examples for. So one of the things that really stood out for me when I was looking through the list is um, intentionally reestablish contact with someone you've lost touch or have a resolved conflict with. So when the pandemic started, and I know I shared this with my IBI team um, last week, when the pandemic started, um, 
it really made me think about the relationships that have gone sour in part, you know, with friends or um, work relationships. And I really took it upon myself to like reconnect with somebody that I haven't really talked to for the past three years. And it just to keep in touch and just say, do you need anything? Because she's kind of older and she's living on her own. And with the school closures and everything like that, I felt like it was my responsibility to just reach out to an old friend and see if she needs anything. And after doing that, it made me feel lighter. It made me feel like I am important and it made me feel, her feel that she's important. So just that intentionally reestablishing contact really makes a big difference. I feel a lot lighter. It feels like a ton of bricks have been lifted. So just that small gesture alone, it was a text message. It took me one minute to compose the text and I sent it. And But the after effect of me reaching out has that lasting effect. It, I feel a lot lighter. I feel like I'm a good person doing that. And so that might be something that simple, simple act of kindness can make a difference, not just for your life, but for the life of that person as well. And then in the morning, you could listen to music that inspires you. And so maybe you could listen to this for a little bit. Right, since we can't go on vacation, I was thinking maybe we could just listen to that music. And I was reading this book by Gretchen Rubin about happiness. And she said that when we have habits early in the morning, we come up with a habit that will lift our mood. It just changes the course of the entire day. So she was saying that some of the people that she uh, researched they said that just playing the music as soon as they get up in the morning, like a lively music or something that they really like, it just livens up the mood for the rest of the day. So maybe make it a habit. When you wake up in the morning, instead of the alarm, the alarm would be a music that you like. So it's not like startling you when you, you're getting up in the morning, but it's just soothing and you wanna, you wanna do something because you feel great. And then along that line, um, they were saying, and I wasn't able to practice it anymore because I'm working from home now. But while we were um, working from home, I think the first couple of weeks, I read this article saying that um, the relationship of spouses are, will turn out better if even if you had a bad day at work, or even if you really were you know, beat up by a student at work, you come home with a smile on your face because that will change the course of the evening for your family. Because when you go inside your house and you have a smile on your face, regardless of whether it was a difficult day, the tone of the, of the evening will be a lot better. And so you're not you know, affecting everybody in the home about your bad mood because they see you're smiling. So they tend to be lighter. Your family will tend to be lighter. They tend to be more understanding and you just say, oh, I had a difficult day, but they appreciate you having a smile on your face when you come home, even if it was a difficult day. So similar to that, when you start your day in the morning, start with a, with, start with, um, a good music to lift your spirits. Oh, not that anymore. Okay. And then another way to practice self-care is to, if you have a pet, you stare at that pet and then contemplate whether about their existence. Were they born to make your life, you know, a lot better if you have pets? I only have birds and I like my birds because they kind of send, sends me this, you know, vibe and like they're chirping. So I feel like I'm always in a jungle in the morning. Unfortunately, when I do my Zoom meetings, they're also very loud. That's why I'm here because they're inside. But the birds have, gives me the, the birds give me this zen feeling when I get home because there's just chirping and so it's nature and I have a small water fountain next to them. So I feel like I'm in, I'm in a, um, a jungle every time. So I will show you this cat and show you how relaxing it is to just watch a cat be massaged and I was watching this and I want this in my life as well. So if you could watch that, if you could go to YouTube 
and just find all the cat videos that you can. It will make you smile at the end of the day. Look how relaxing that cat looks like. like he's so relaxed. I was just watching it. I, I think I grabbed that from um, Oprah's um, Instagram. All right. Another way for us to practice self-care is to listen to a podcast that um, interests you. And I researched um, specific teacher podcasts and I found 10 that are really good. The first one, the HMH Learning Moments, is really um, very nice because it gives like stories about stressful situations with just in the education field. So there are 10 of these podcasts and they're free so you're more than welcome to like download it and just listen to it i i drive a lot in my line of work i average honestly i'm not even kidding i average 100 miles a day uh just driving from one site to the next and there are days in the month that i have to go all the way to blythe and I feel that it's a good opportunity for me to learn something new. So either I listen to an audiobook or I listen to a podcast when I'm driving because I feel like it's it's such a waste of time and a learning opportunity if I just listen to music for three hours. What if I learn from other teachers and other educators? So this um, this list right here, they're all good. I have downloaded um, most of them, especially the HMH one, the one minute, te the TED, one 10 minute teacher is really good too. And the truth for teachers, that's really good. So I'll give you a copy of the PowerPoint so you have um, a copy of the different podcasts that's available. And then part of the 175 ideas for self-care, write something encouraging on a post-it and put it where you will see it every day. And there you go. Like you say to yourself, hey, you got this. You, um, you taste the back of your hand so you know what winter tastes like. And so this is, um, I believe it's the cat, I, I forgot what the name of the website is, but it's about a cat having all these self-care ideas for the owner and she puts it on um, her toilet seat. So when she wakes up in the morning, she see, it's the first thing that she sees and she changes it every day. So that's something that we could all practice. It doesn't cost us a thing. And I'm sure you have post-its in your house from the school, right? <laughs> and then we also can do, um, handwrite a letter to a friend. You know, when, when email first came out, I was so excited about receiving an email. I was like, ding! And then you got mail. And that was the most exciting day, part of my day. And then emails became so common that now I get more excited when I receive a handwritten note from um, either my mother-in-law. Unfortunately, my mother-in-law passed away, but she was one who always gave me handwritten birthday cards, handwritten out of the blue cards. And so when she passed away, I did not receive a lot of um, handwritten cards anymore. So when friends just send over like thank you notes and it just makes me feel special because we don't get that anymore. We are so used to like emails and just typing up everything that handwritten notes really make a big difference in our lives. And I just like to share this book with all of you. It's called The Thank You Project. So basically, um, Nancy uh, Davis Cole is an author, is the author of the book. On her 50th birthday, she decided that by the time she um, ends her 50th birthday, she would have already written 50 handwritten thank you notes, thank you um, cards to people who influenced her, not necessarily people uh, close to her, but people who made a difference in her life. So that was her 50th birthday project to uh, write handwritten notes. Oh, what I want to pipe in here, um, just because I can't stay quiet for too long. Okay, in, my, in my last district, it, um, our superintendent um, made that a practice that we would make, we would do handwritten notes at the beginning of the meeting. He's like, I want you to take this time now to write a note to somebody and send it within the district. And um, it would, I would get thank you notes about my thank you notes from people. It's like we've lost that connection with others of taking that time to hand write something and emails are nice 
but handwritten notes are something that we've lost, but people appreciate so much. So I just wanted to say shout out. I, I, I it's a great idea. Shelly, it's a lost art. And I have been, I don't know if you guys do like the, the Conmary method of decluttering, but I have been decluttering like crazy. And um, if you look behind me, I do not declutter. I've got some problems, but go ahead. But she said that the hardest to let go of when you're decluttering is those m important notes and handwritten notes and everything like that, because they're very dear to you. So she said that she's extreme. Like she wants like pictures thrown away and, and note cards thrown away. And that was the hardest for me to go through her uh, book because I could declutter my clothes. I could declutter all the books, you know, in the house and, and everything else. But thank you notes. I feel that those not thank you notes, just handwritten notes, just letters in general. I feel that I will treasure them for the rest of my life. And I feel bad, even if it's just a Christmas card that has um, a handwritten note of happy holidays and it has the name of December. I keep it because I feel like it's a lost art. So what I did was just dedicate two drawers in my credenza at home just for my thank you and letters. And it and every time, honestly, I do it. I'm not, I'm not just saying it because I'm doing a presentation. When I feel down, when I feel like I had a bad day, I just open that drawer and just randomly pick up pick a card or whatever letter I get. And I feel instantly, I feel like, oh. People like me. Oh, I did something. I did something that people appreciate because they're sending me this thank you note. So it has really just um, been one of my de-stressors uh, when I look at that drawer. It de-stresses me when I, I read some of the letters that I have. Oh, and I want to pipe in there too. Um, one of the the person that I student taught with, he would have a file in his file cabinet in an actual brick and mortar school, and he would call it his feel good file, mm -hmm. and that's things that he would put that students um, appreciated what he did and do those things so he could go over to that file when he ha wasn't having a great day with students and be like you know what this is why I did it this is why I do it this is why I need to stay on my path so it's a way to recenter yourself I'll stop talking sorry no please no please I really I'm glad that I'm getting this feedback because I've been talking for like 45 minutes now and I'm not sure if it's getting the message is getting through so I really appreciate you chiming in um Shelly but I did get this book because um, I'm not turning 50 yet, but I know that I really don't have the time to just write 50 letters in a, in, in a year. So what I've been doing is I've been slowly writing letters. So by the time I reach 50, which is like in two years, I would have already written 50 letters to everybody who's important to me. Um, I've written letters to my, um, she recommends writing letters to your, parents first because um, she said that it was one of her best decisions to write to her dad as one of the first uh, recipients for her letter because her dad passed away um, from an accident I believe so it was a sudden death and so she was glad that she wrote him a letter stating all the things that made her um, love him as you know as a dad you did made this you made this happen and so before her dad passed away she was able to express every bit of gratitude he she had for him so it was really like um, yeah and so I, I wrote to my parents I wrote to um, my mentor who believed in me I, I don't know um, you guys when I first um, taught at Red Maple I know Keisha was probably uh, at the same time that um, I started with RCOE. When I was, um, I took over the classroom from Nicole Solorio and I had no idea how to write IEP goals. My first day as the teacher for that classroom, I had to have an IEP. And I thought that it was the principal's um, responsibility to write IEP goals. So I had an IEP and they were looking for the goals and I had nothing. And I thought that I was going to be fired um, because I was so incompetent. I wanted to melt in that IEP room because people were staring at me. Parent was staring at me. My principal was staring at me. They were like, okay, so what, the, what are the goals that you have? And I said, I don't have any. I thought you were going to write it. And then I really thought she was going to fire me, but she didn't. And she became a mentor. So she was one of the 
people that I also wrote to because if she did not believe in me, I wouldn't be here doing this presentation. So all these little things that we take for granted, all those small um, you know, stories that shaped us, I think people need to know that they made a difference in our lives and that they shaped us to become better people. So like what you said, Shelly, I wish we could do that for the county, right? At the beginning of the school year, just write something and it will make a big difference in the lives of a lot of people. All right, so, and then another set of different ideas. You finished the sentence, I love myself because, and I was looking at the internet and I really like this Mr. Bean one, where he said that you better love yourself because you're the only person who will be with you for the rest of your life. So really, we have to make sure that we take care of ourselves, practice self-care because, you know, they will all come and go, but you stay with yourself. So make sure that you practice self-care and love yourself as if your life depended on it. And then um, we allow ourselves to sleep in for an extra couple of hours during the weekend. I've been sleeping in when uh, prior to the pandemic, I would wake up and Christina's here, like we'd wake up at four in the morning because we'd get um, last minute texts from um, behavior support assistants or, or one on ones who decided not to go to work that day. And so you're scrambling because it's a one on one position in a district, you know, uh, gen ed program. If no one shows up, then it all hell will break loose. So, like, I really did not get a lot of sleep when um, prior to the pandemic for like the past eight years. <laughs> But I've been sleeping in and I, I feel that my mood is a lot better because I'm getting that extra, you know, few minutes of sleep. So sleep, having enough sleep gives us better concentration. We have a better memory and recall. It helps with our creativity. I feel like I've been creative with uh, this pandemic. I, there's just a lot of ideas um, floating in, um, in and out. And so I feel like maybe... This is a time, you know, when the pandemic started and you, I, I told my team about this, you, I always said, I can't do this project because I just don't have the time. Now I have so much time and I still haven't started the project. So I don't think it's the time that's the issue. But I, I think I've slowly got into the routine that now my creative juices have been flowing again. I was like, maybe I should write, like create a playbook, a handbook for like, how do we handle, um, behaviors before we go back to school make sure we have that handbook for the teachers and the instruction assistants so how do we teach physical distancing now so that when they're going back to the school they already have it in their repertoire so maybe like a handbook for that so i, I was thinking about that it's just hard to like import all the pdf file to a word document without messing up the messing up the format so i'm still in the process of doing that uh it helps having a lot of sleep not a lot of sleep but enough sleep makes us uh make better decisions and we don't focus much on the negative things and our immune system is a lot um stronger if we have enough sleep so we are um hopefully resistant to the covid virus and then um another set of ideas it says right here that we could ask for help when we need it and i really think this is really powerful that a lot of us refuse to ask for help because we think that it's a sign of weakness for us or that we're afraid that people will reject us asking for help. But this was really powerful when I was looking at for quotes. Rather than being afraid to ask for help, remember this, when you ask somebody to help you, you are actually doing them a tremendous favor by giving them the opportunity to feel needed. And if I really reflect on this, I feel that when people ask for my help, I feel important. I feel like they think that I have something to offer. And it's always like us thinking that they don't want to help us, but in a way, when we ask for help and the people that we ask help from really wants to help, it's empowering them. It's giving them the opportunity to feel needed. So think about Think of it that way as well, not just one-sided, but it's a symbiotic relationship, asking for help and feeling needed. It goes both ways. And then I'm towards the end of the presentation, guys. Go dancing as if no one's watching. And I wanted to show you this video because there's no age limit to when it comes to dancing. And look at this dad go. Can you do that? 
Dad, people need you. They need you, Dad. I just don't know, guys. We can do this, Dad. We believe in you. You're right. I can do this. <laughs> All right. Can you do that? So that's dad. And I feel that he actually had better moves than the younger ones. And so I I know that we always like, oh we I don't have the I don't have the you know the dance moves or I don't have the ability to do that, but we just need to try. Even if you if you're shy dancing in front of everybody, then dance in the shower, close your doors, bedroom doors, and just like dance, and it will make you feel better. Like that video I showed you a few minutes earlier, where it feels like a 17-year vacation because you did something for yourself. So just shut that door and keep on dancing. And then the next two slides are just free apps for, for calm and peace. So these are the things that I saw online that helps calm down. So like the Calm app, I'm sure when you watch TV, you see that all the time where they show like a waterfall and then it has a timer for you to do your deep breathing exercises. It helps make use of the phone in a more, uh, in a calm way, not just stressful, but something, use the gadget, it's right there. So just download those apps that are free in order for you to be able to find inner peace so there's like 10 of them and I could just give you and all of them are free some of them actually need like in-app purchases but if you just want the basic then then they're free and this is the last slide for today and I'd like to end with a sur survival kit for for educators um, that I hope you get markers because it will remind you to leave a good mark wherever you go and a pencil to remind you that there are many things that need to be learned, still many things that we can learn. Marbles to replace the ones that you lost during the school year. A penny because to remind you that your thoughts are important and so you have to share them with others. Eraser to remind you that it's all right to make mistakes. Rubber band to remind you to be flexible. Smarties to remind you that you're a smart cookie, smarty bubble gum to remind you to stick with it and and you can accomplish anything a paper clip to keep help hold it to all together snickers to remind you to keep your sense of humor and lifesaver to remind you of the many times that you've been one and i know most of us are in special ed and you have no idea as a parent i am thankful for for you guys choosing this field because honestly, and I'm being 100% honest here, I don't think I would be in special ed if it weren't for Ethan. I, I, it was a career path that was um, an afterthought. I wasn't really trained. My PhD wasn't really on special ed, um, but I had to do like a 180 degree turn to go to special ed because I wanted to help my son. But you guys, you didn't, most of you, or probably all of you do not have um, that experience to force you to special ed, you chose this path. And I'm just really grateful as a parent that there are teachers out there willing to get beaten up, willing to get spit at, willing to have all these difficult days and challenging days handling behaviors because it's your passion. So I just like to end there that you know that you are a lifesaver for a lot of families. And although you don't feel it, I, as a parent, feel it, and I can never thank you guys enough for choosing this field because you make the life of not just my child, but all the special ed students in our RCU program extra special, and the quality of their lives are a lot better because of all the hard work that you do. So thank you for attending this training. I hope and all I would, I would like you to, I'd like to thank you for keeping in mind that our, our educators are one of the most selfless people that we have in the country and a lot of times they don't take the time for themselves and so by showing up here today you guys understand that you have to take the oxygen mask first 
on this plane that we're building all at the same time. So I wanna echo, thank you for knowing what our teachers need all it, and thank everybody for coming, for getting the oxygen they need. Sorry to interrupt you all, but I just wanted to get that in. And I just like, I know it's a stressful time. We don't know what's gonna happen <laughs> in the next two months or so with uh, everything that's going on. It's like, um, the social distancing has been thrown out the window the last couple of days, but I really hope you guys stay healthy and safe because our students need us um, in the next two months. I'm not sure how it would look like with uh, the setup that we have, but we need safe and healthy teachers so that when we eventually return back to work, um, your, your students are there ready to give you a hug, hopefully with a PPE. That way you are not, you know, a, and, and in danger, but I am looking forward to seeing you guys again in person, hopefully soon, and hopefully in a safe manner. Thank you for attending today. Shelly, thank you for giving me the opportunity. I know it's, it's out of character for me to do a training on self-care, but it was really something that I enjoyed doing. No, no, no. I, you know, we all have talents, and you know what? Hearing things in different ways from different people is what gets through to people. So I am willing for anybody who wants to come to put things on. So it, I, I heard something that I needed to hear today. I need to schedule myself so that I make sure that I do things for myself. So I thank you. Um, lots of people asked for the resources. So if you don't mind sharing your PowerPoint, I'll get that out to everybody. I'll send the PowerPoint and I'll send the self-care plan because it's like a booklet of like 16 pages long. I just did, I just cut and paste some of the, some of the components. But if you want the entire booklet, That's I could send great. that over to you. That would be great. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Have a good summer.